Hello and welcome to this new series of videos with me, Mr. Barnes, where we're going to have a look at some key authors from the Gothic literature genre. This is what Key Stage 3 are looking at at the moment, so it will be nice to have a look at some different examples of people and some of their work over the next few videos. The first person we're going to have a look at then is Edgar Allan Poe. So who was Edgar Allan Poe? Edgar Allan Poe was born on January the 19th, 1809 in Boston, Massachusetts. He died on October the 7th, 1849 in Baltimore, Maryland. He was an American short story writer, poet, critic and editor who was famous for his cultivation of mystery and the macabre. His tale, The Murders of the Rue, Rue Morgue, in 1841, initiated the modern detective story. And the atmosphere in his tales of horror is unrivaled in fiction. His The Raven of 1845 numbers among the best known poems in literature. Some of his notable works include The Fall of House Usher, The Purloined Letter, The Telltale Heart, The Black Cat, The Raven, Manuscript Found in a Bottle, and The Pit and the Pendulum. Life and Death of Edgar Allan Poe. Poe was the son of the English born actress Elizabeth Arne and David Poe Jr., an actor from Baltimore. After his mother died in Richmond, Virginia in 1811, he was taken to the home of John Allen, a Richmond merchant, presumably his godfather, and his wife. He was later taken to Scotland and England between 1815 and 1820, where he was given a classical education that was continued in Richmond. For 11 months in 1826, he attended the University of Virginia, but his gambling losses at the university so incensed his guardian that he refused to let him continue. Paul returned to Richmond to find his childhood sweetheart, Elmira Royster, was already engaged to somebody else. Heartbroken, he went to Boston, where, in 1827, he published a pamphlet of useful Byronic poems, Tamerlane, and other poems. Poverty forced him to join the army under the name of Edgar A. Perry, but on the death of Poe's foster mother, John Allen purchased his release from the army and helped him to get an appointment at the US Military Academy at West Point. Before going, Poe published a new volume of Baltimore, Alaraf, Tamerland, and Minor Poems, in 1829. He successfully saw expulsion from the academy where he was absent from all drills and classes for a week. He proceeded to New York City and brought out a volume of poems containing several masterpieces showing the influence of Keats, Percy Shelley and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He then returned to Baltimore where he began to write stories. In 1833 his message found in a bottle won $50 from a Baltimore Weekly and by 1835 he was in Richmond as editor of the Southern Literary Messenger. There he made a name as a critical reviewer and married Virginia Clem. Paul seems to have been an affectionate husband and a good son-in-law. He was dismissed from his job in Richmond apparently for drinking and he went to New York City. The drinking was in fact to be the bane of his life. To talk well in a large company he needed a slight a stimulant but a glass of sherry might start him on a spree, and although he rarely got drunk, he was often seen in public when he did. This gave rise to the rumour that Paul was a drug addict. But according to medical testimony, he had a brain lesion. While in New York City in 1838, he published a long prose narrative, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, combining, as so often is tales, much factual material wildest of fantasies. It's considered one of the inspirations for Herman Melville's Moby Dick. In 1839, he became co-editor of Burton Gentleman's magazine in Philadelphia. There, a contract for a monthly feature led him to write William Wilson and The Fall of House Usher, stories of supernatural horror. The latter contains a study of, new, of a neurotic now known to have been an acquaintance of Poe not Poe himself. Later, in 1839, Poe's Tales from the Grotesque appeared, dated in 1840, 
He resigned from Burton's about June 1840, but returned in 1841 to edit its successor, Graham's Lady and Gentleman's Magazine, in which he printed The Murders in the Rue Morgue, the first detective story. In 1843, his The Gold Bug won a prize of $100 from the Philadelphia Dollar newspaper, which gave him great publicity. And in 1844, he returned to New York and wrote The Balloon Hoax for the Sun and became sub-editor of the New York Mirror under N.P. Willis, who would become a lifelong friend. In the New York Mirror of January 29, 1845, appeared from advanced sheets of the American Review, his most famous poem, The Raven, which gave him national fame. Poe then became the editor of the Broadway Journal, a short-lived weekly in which he published most of his short stories in 1845. His The Raven and other poems and a selection of his tales came out in 1845 and in 1846 Poe moved to a cottage in Fordham, now part of New York City, where he wrote Goddy's Late Book between May and October of that same year. The literati of New York City gossipy sketches on personality of the day, which led to a libel. Poe's wife, Virginia, died in January 1847. The following year, he went to Providence, Rhode Island, to woo a lady by the name of Sarah Helen Whitman, who was also a poet. There was a brief engagement. The Poe had close but platonic engagements with Annie Richmond and with Sarah Anna Lewis, who helped him financially. He composed poetic, tri poetic tributes to all of them. In 1848, he also published the lecture Eureka, a transcendental explanation of the universe, which has been hailed as a masterpiece by some, and by utter nonsense by others. In 1849, he went south, had a wild spree in Philadelphia, but got safely to Richmond, where he finally became engaged to Elmira Royster, his childhood sweetheart, who was then the widowed Mrs. Shelton. They spent a happy summer with only one or two relapses, and he enjoyed the companionship of childhood friends and an unromantic friendship with a young poet by the name of Susan Archer Talley. Poe had some foreboding of death when he left Richmond for Baltimore later in September, where he died. Although whether this was from drinking, heart failure, or other causes is still uncertain, even now. He was buried in Westminster Presbyterian Churchyard in Baltimore. So what is Edgar Allan Poe's legacy? Poe's work owes much to the concern of romanticism, of the occult, and the satanic. It owes much to his own feverish dreams to which he applied a rare faculty of shaping plausible fabrics out of, um, in, out of impalatable materials. And with an air of objectivity and spontaneity, his productions are closely dependent on his own powers of imagination and an elaborate technique. His keen and sound judgment as an appraiser of contemporary literature, his idealism and musical gift as a poet, his dramatic art as a storyteller, considerably appreciated in his own lifetime, secured him a prominent place among universally known men of letters. The outstanding fact in Poe's character is a strange duality. The wide divergence of contemporary judgments on the man seems almost a point to the coexistence of two persons within him. With those he loved, he was gentle and devoted, Others, who were the butt of his sharp criticisms, found him to be irritable and self-centred, and went so far as to accuse him of a lack of principle. Was it, it has been asked, a double of the man rising from harrowing nightmares, or from a haggard inner version of dark crimes, or from appalling graveyard fantasies that loomed in Paul's unstable being? Much of Poe's best work is concerned with terror and sadness. But in ordinary circumstances, the poet was a pleasant companion. He talked brilliantly, chiefly of literature, and read his own poetry and that of others 
in a voice of surpassing beauty. He admired Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. He had a sense of humour, apologising to a visitor for not keeping a pet raven. If the mind of Poe is considered, the duality is still more striking. On one side, he was an idealist and a visionary. His yearning for the ideal was both of the heart and the imagination. His sensitivity to the beauty and sweetness of women inspired his most touching lyrics to Helen, Annabel Lee, in one, uh, to one in Paradise. And the full toned prose hymns of beauty and love in Ligera and Eleonora. In Israfel, his imagination carried him away from the material world into a dreamland. This Pythian mood was especially characteristic of his later years of his life. More generally, in such verses as The Valley of Unrest, Lenore, The Raven, For Annie, and Eulalani, and in his prose tales, his familiar model of evasion from the universe and common experience was through airy thoughts, impulses, and fears. And these materials he drew from startling effects of his tale to death, the fall of the house usher, the mask of the red death, the facts in the case of M. Valdemar, the oval portrait, shadow, his tales of wickedness and crime, Berenice, the black cat, William Wilson, the telltale heart, his tales of survivor, survival after disillusion, and his tales of fatality, the assignation, the man of the crowd. Even when he does not hurl his characters into the clutch of mysterious forces or onto the untrodden paths of the beyond, he uses the anguish of the imminent death as the means of causing the nerves to quiver. And his grotesque invention deals with corpses and decay in an uncanny play of the aftermath of death. On the other side, Poe is conspicuous for a close observation of minute details, as in the long narrative and in many of the descriptions that introduce the tales or constitute their settings. Closely connected with this is his power of racial assassination. He prided himself on his logic and carefully handled this real accomplishment as so as to impress the public with his possessing still more of it than he had. Hence the would-be feats of thought, reading, problem unravelling, and cryptography that he attributed to his characters. This suggested to him the analytical tales which created detective story and his science fiction tales. The same duality is evidence in his art. He was capable of writing angelic or weird poetry with a supreme sense of rhythm and word appeal, or prose of sumptuous beauty and suggestiveness with the apparent abandonment of compelling inspiration. Yet he would write down a problem of morbid psychology or the outlines of an unrelenting plot in a hard and dry style. In Poe's masterpieces, the dull contents of his temper of his mind and his art are fused into a oneness of tone, structure and movement, and more effective perhaps as it's compounded of various elements. Poe's genius was early recognised abroad. No one did more to persuade the world and in the long run the United States of Poe's greatness than the French poets of Charles Baudelaire and Stephen Mallarme. Indeed, his role in French literature was that of a poetic, poetic master model and a guide to criticism. French symbolism relied on his the philosophy of composition, borrowed from his imagery and used his examples to generate the theory of pure poetry. 